Welcome to the Aerospace Executive Podcast, featuring in-depth conversations with executives, leaders, influencers, and journalists in this dynamic, high-stakes industry. Hosted by Craig Pickin, founder of Northstar Group, the boutique executive search firm for the aerospace industry. You'll learn how top aerospace executives are developing their people, competing for talent, overcoming challenges, and adjusting to industry trends to drive growth and profits. And now, let's join your host, Greg Pickett. Hey, welcome uh, back to the uh, Aerospace Executive Podcast. I am, uh, I'm really thrilled today to have Brian Foley on with me. Um, Brian, if you read uh, Forbes magazine, he's a frequent contributor on aviation issues into Forbes. He works with uh, a lot of investment bankers, um, helping them evaluate opportunities in the space. He's got his own company. Uh, he's the founder of uh, Av Strategies, based out of New Jersey. Just great to have you here today, Brian. How's things? Oh, uh, good. Except being in New Jersey, everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, election year is coming up, and uh, well, New Jersey's not bad though. It's all right. No, I'm I'm just teasing. We're we're in a pretty nice area. Kind of, if, if if it sounds kind of like an oxymoron, but we're in the rural part of New Jersey. If there is such a thing. Yeah, out west. Yeah, out west exactly. of Teterboro. Yeah, yeah got you. West, but, almost uh, in Pennsylvania. So, great article in Forbes. We talked about last week um, offline a little bit about you know, hey, what's happening with Bombardier, but. You know, what do you see? You know, let's start with business aviation and work from there. What do you uh, What are you seeing in the business aviation world? Where are the uh, Where are the opportunities? Where are the stumbling blocks? What are you advising your clients on? Yeah, it's it's been a little flat for the last decade, I'd say. Um, it had a, a great peak back in the 07 time frame, but then along came the financial crisis and it took a hit. And it's really just been. Uh, stable if you will between 600 and 700 units delivered yearly it used to be 1400 so it's, it's been quite a drop um a lot of folks in the industry are asking me you know when, when are we going to bounce back up to 1300 units and i have to remind them um you know that was sort of a a perfect storm when that happened and we should be thankful that we're not going down any further right now so be, being stable and flat is is in a sense a good thing it's it's a sustainable level and uh, every, everyone is charging on. Yeah, so six or 700 units is the, is the new normal. I mean, when we were doing 13, 1400 units, it was when you know, NetJets was just kicking off and kind of hitting its stride and FlexJet doing the same. Travel Air Raytheon was, was coming on strong. So the, that, the fractional that, players were right. gearing up. Yeah, the, the, the kind of things that made it go uh, kooky there was supply and demand. There just wasn't enough uh, business jets for people. So they started piling in the orders. Um, the emerging markets were doing great. So they had uh, you know money to, to buy these things. The, the natural resources were high priced. So that helped people buy business jets. And just everything was uh, going well with international stock markets. Uh, the dollar was low, which meant that the price of a business jet um, you know, was, was a Affordable at the time, so there's there's been a number of uh, things that have that, that helped that. But ever since then, it kind of kind of switched around, and it's not uh, not not quite the way it was. So, does six to seven hundred deliveries a year sustain the industry? What needs to happen? Well, today there's uh, you know four or five principal manufacturers uh, producing forty different models of business jets for this you know six or seven hundred models a year. So there's, it, it's it's really a crowded market. It ar arguably has to uh, contract a little bit. You know, that six to 700 units is, there's a little cheap built in there too to make it look like it's sustained. Um, about three or four years ago, the very low priced, uh, low value Cirrus SF50, um, the little single engine jet started mm -hmm. coming to the market. And that gets counted as a jet delivery, even though it's you know pretty much a flying phone booth, if you will, sort of a toy jet, right? And and so that's that's sort of artificially brought the number and up, you know, of total deliveries and kept it looking six to seven hundred. But if you look at the the principal jet makers and you strip out that little SS fifty, you know, we've we we've lost about uh, another another ten percent off that six or seven hundred. So it's uh, Without the SF50, that we, we would have been downtrending the last few years. 
So and and the and the obviously the 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 winner in the segment has been the very has been the bigger cabin stuff, the Gulfstream 550, 650. We'll see, you know, 500, 600. The global, you know, the global express and now the global 7500. So the big cabin stuff has really been selling well and you know, getting good book to bill ratios, but the little jet, you know, the smaller jet market's been pretty pretty tight. You know, uh, is Learjet going to be around in a year? Yeah, well, there, there's been kind of an about face. Um, during the financial downturn, the, the big cabin guys really sustained the market because Ch China hadn't been hit yet. Um, you know, South, South America, Russia, they, they weren't canceling their big cabin orders. Um, those big cabin orders that were placed by North American companies, they had the wherewithal to weather the storm and, and keep their orders in there. Um, but the small and medium cabin guys back during the crisis, they all ran for the exits. So what we saw was a, a bunch of big cabin aircraft being delivered and not so much in the medium and small. Um, it's getting back a, a, a little more in parity where it's about a, a, a third each now, <laughs> I'd say. And the big cabin has trailed off a little bit as far as the, the share um, because a lot of these emerging markets aren't doing so hot anymore. And there's, you know, uh, geopolitical turmoil in you know Russia, um, you know, mm -hmm. Ch China. Their economy is doing poor right now. So the big big cabin guys are a little slow right now. Um, but we we've, we've seen as far as the the winners out there are really the manufacturers that are coming out with new products and giving the market a reason to get out there and, and buy something. So as you pointed out, you know the global um, seventy five hundred is out there from Bombardier. Um, the G500 and 600 from Gulfstream, um, Dassault coming forward with the, the, the 6X and the relatively new 8X still. Mm -hmm. And Cessna just pushing out the uh, um, the lo longitude, getting that certified. And even, even Embraer is making some nice upgrades to some existing products. So that's, that's helped the, churn the market and, and keep people coming to the showroom and buying. Right. Yeah. Hey, look, they're all great airplanes. I mean, they, you yeah, know, the, they're all... Yeah, you know, they're all terrific airplanes that fit their little niches, you know, well. Yeah, there's, um, there's no single manufacturer that's the, the the answer to everyone. You have to find your niche, like you, like you pointed out, and, and exceed well in that area. Yeah, no, I hear you. So, um, where are the opportunities? I mean, you know, if you're if you're you know, if you're advising your clients, you know, if, be, be it in you know, business aviation, commercial aviation, the aftermarket, what do you, uh, you know, where do you see the, the growth occurring? Well, fortunately, the North American market has always been the largest market and two, two thirds of the business um, jet fleet is based here. And luckily, although emerging markets are slow now and, and places, you know, outside our borders, uh, the strongest market has been, you know, pr pretty decent. You know, the companies have strong, you know, balance sheets. Um, individuals have dollars to, to, to spend. So fortunately, that's kept us afloat. Um, there's no one area that's stand out right now. It, it'll be a few years before the likes of, uh, you know, Latin and South America come back online. Mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely some dust to settle over in Asia before that picks up again. So hopefully, you know, we can keep things going here in the, the U.S. and North America. Um, I've argued that if if we puff out <laughs> and there is some kind of recession here, um, there's no safety net for the business jet industry like there was back in the you know 06, 07 time frame. When Nor North America and major um, markets caved, the emerging markets kept us afloat and they kept their deliveries coming and, and things were all peachy keen there. So we, we had that nice safety net to keep things from getting worse. But if things do get hit here in North America, um, there, there's no no nowhere to catch us right now. Yeah, well, that's yeah. Hey, look, it's it's been the United States that's been keeping the world economy, you know, going. And you know, you talk about China. Look, I I, I was never really um, bullish on China to begin with. I thought it was kind of a fad, mm -hmm. um, especially with with the Xi in, in power now and the way the government's going. I'm not, you know, is there, you know, are we ever going to really see a resurgence in China in business yeah. jets? Eventually, it, it'll it'll come back, yeah. but but not in the next uh, five years, probably. Okay, so you think the infrastructure and the government and the environment over there will actually sustain, you know, a relative market? 
not not so much domestically, but a lot of the purchases made before were to fly internationally between business centers. But mm -hmm. you're right, flying uh, you know within the borders is still problematic, and it seems to take you know years or decades to you know straighten that out and get some some relaxation in those areas. Yeah. So, um, you know, let's talk on the periphery. You got flight safety. Major changes at flight safety now. New CEO coming in. I don't know if they've announced it or not. You know, but, but uh, Brad Thress is is going over there and taking that over. Um, CAE. Its stock has doubled in the last eighteen months. Um, pilot shortages. How do you think the pilot shortages and the training and the and the the training situation? You know, affect yeah, affect our industry. It's, it seems to be a. Uh a real problem right now and, and people looking for solutions. Um, we just saw, you know, United by a training academy out in the Phoenix area, I believe yep. it was. So they're trying to capture that uh, existing academy so they can put their own cadets through there and try to move them into the cockpit. Um, and I, you know, look after the little general aviation airplanes too, and, and the Pipers and Cessnas and Diamonds. They're they're selling a ton of airplanes to these academies and yep. and overseas to train pilots. Um, so there's it seems to be helping the industry this this shortage, and I'm sure that's what's flowing over to CAE and flight safety as well. Yeah, well, I see one. I think one of the you know one of the quietest success stories right now is Piper. You know, they're going yeah. there. Piper is selling a lot of airplanes and yeah, yeah. You know, everybody thought kind of back during the, uh, back during the, you know, the economic depression that we went through that, uh, the great recession that they were kind of cooked. Yeah. The, you know, the Piper jet, but they've done really well, just kind of quietly hitting the, you know, hitting their mark. Yeah. The P Piper jet was back in the, the dark days, I guess, when things did slow down there a lot. Um, they, they canceled or shelled that program and, and sustained, um, but it was wasn't until the last couple of years that the training market came alive, and, and they're looking pretty good right now. Yeah, and and those jet, those airplanes look training airplanes. They wear out fast, so that creates an aftermarket, and you know it's it's a good it's a good uh, you know it's kind of a good story. Um, pilots, how do you you know, you got everybody says hey we got a shortage of pilots. I mean obviously the price of pilots in business aviation is going up. A lot of people don't want to fly part 135. Um, you know, how's that affecting flight departments? Well, yeah, there, there's been a little exodus from flight departments over to the airline side. You know, they're, they're, the airlines are holding a carrot out there that you have a predictable schedule. You know, you'll know when you'll be home, you know when you'll be out. Um, corporate doesn't always afford that luxury, and, and you have to you know, basically book a number of days that you could be on and then some days you could be off. And, that doesn't always fit with uh, people's lifestyle. Uh, but yeah, the business aviation end is, is being poached a little bit, I guess, by the airlines. Is 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 a flight department going to have to pay 250 grand for a for a pilot to keep them there? Yeah, it seems seems to be moving in that direction for uh, yeah, big big cabin globals, that sort of thing. I, I see numbers, you know, getting up into that area and, and more. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no. So um where else? I mean, you know, obviously, you know, business aviation. So you put out a you put out an article, um, you know, in Forbes two weeks ago. We talked about you know you talked about Bombardier a little bit. What do you think? Uh, you know, what do you think the scenario is? You know, with uh, with where all that's going. I mean, obviously, they got nine billion dollars of debt, and you know, between trains and planes, they're not uh, they don't have a prayer paying it off. How does that thing you know all get restructured? That's that's the biggest story in business aviation today. You know, when you have a major manufacturer that makes the Learjet, that makes the Challenger, that makes the Global Express, um, hinting that there might be a sale in the future, it uh, you know gets people to notice. And you know, I wrote a little story, as you mentioned, you know, just trying to uh, um, f figure out that if there was a buyer, who that could be, and. We gave it some thought and, and eliminated Gulfstream because that Global Express would sit right on top of their product line. Um, same with Dassault. They make big cabin stuff like the Global, and it wouldn't fit for them. Um, Embraer is tied up today with the, the Boeing deal, so that they, they'd probably be a little hesitant. Um, so the 
you know, logical suspect, if there was to be a BizJet strategic to buy that, would be the Textron folks. Because today, Textron has a nice product line from little bug basher trainer airplanes uh, up to turboprops into entry-level jets. And up to the, I'd say, super midsize with their new longitude. But they don't have anything after that. They don't have any long-range stuff. So the global product line of Bombardier would be a nice fit for them. Um, there would be a little overlap, though, with the Cessna Textron overlap. And that would raise some questions for Learjet because that's the, the Cessna Citation's uh, mm -hmm. you know, real strength is, is in that size. And to some extent, the Challenger line too, which is the next size up made by Bombardier. And with the longitude, uh, you know, there's, there's a little overlap there too, but definitely the global program uh, could be of interest to Textron. Yeah, do you think they keep, would they keep the, does, uh, you know, the, the Challenger 350 though is still a really good airplane? It's, no, no one argues that that's an excellent machine. They sold a ton of them. Uh, the market really loves them. They've proven themselves. Um, it hasn't had an update in a while, so I suspect the new owner, you know, if they decide to keep that, would have to, um, you know, do a little investment. Um, the Challenger 650, which is the next bigger, you know, wider cabin mm -hmm. one, um, is actually based on a 1970s design um, it's that, old. that started at Lear, believe it or not, before it was taken over to Bombardier. Um, and they they've grown and tweaked and um, you know put put new avionics in you know you know jiggled the engines and put some new things on. There's really nowhere left to go with that airplane, so that's right. the, the the question mark. What kind of future that would have? It's de definitely ready for a, a major yeah. That's uh, look. That's old technology. It's a nice yeah. you know I don't even know what it's selling for. It's a nice cabin performance is yeah average yeah. comparative comparatively right. today. <laughs> People buy it for the big cabin. It's it's relatively cheap for the size cabin you get, but it's a uh, yeah, 1970s. Yeah. I think it was called the Lear Star design or, or something like that. Yeah, but but when I think about a Lear 70 75 at nine million bucks, that that seems to be a pretty good value compared to, you know, maybe not compared to a Phenom 300 or a you know, PC 24, or yeah. is it or is the is the market for that airplane just kind of you know beyond it? Yeah, it's been been very weak. Um, it's a little better this year. Um, Lear uh, made a version of that called the Liberty, where they basically took a bunch of equipment out of it, like the, the APU and some seats, and brought the price down even more. Um, that w that helped to move twelve units this year, which I think is the highest in in, in many many years. Um, out of seven hundred airplane deliveries, though, that's that's still not a big number. Um, you know, there's some question in my mind whether that Liberty was a move to get get more product out there or to eliminate or to eliminate the rest of the inventory so they could, you know, move on from the Learjet division into something else. You know, I'm still pretty bullish on the uh, on the market. I mean, at the end of the day, look, it's a good industry. You've got some great manufacturers and they all make really good airplanes. I mean, you know, where do they need to go next? I mean, Embraer makes a, has, has really done well with the Prater. Gulfstream is just you know, committed to the 700. Um, yeah, a lot of people say that was a pretty bold move, but I think it needed to be done. The Global 7500 is a great airplane too, um, yeah. as is, you know, with the Cessna products. What do you, uh, you know, what do, what do they need to be doing? Do they need to be just bringing as much cost out of these things as they can? Do they have, you know, are they going to be able to you know, have some pricing power on the back end? What, uh, what's your thoughts? Yeah, the, the, the structurally the industry is still overcrowded, and even if you had a some, some kind of a Textron Bombardier tie-up, um, that would maybe eliminate a maximum of four products. So you'd have you know th thirty-six models amongst the uh, you know four four manufacturers. It's still still too crowded, um, but it's it would be a move in the right direction. Um, the last contraction happened a number of years ago when Textron bought the Hawker Beechcraft line and shut down the, uh, the the 900 the premier and uh, one other one i can't remember but they you know that, that well, the horizon the, the 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 four the four thousand that's right the four thousand and uh, one more i believe but um that that really wasn't enough to make a dent in the number of airplanes and, and this will help a little bit um as far as where you go next i see um a, a couple areas um one one is anything to do with fuel efficiency you know the the airline um, sales, you know, took quite a jump when they're able to come up with engines that were 15 to 20% more efficient. 
maybe if that gets translated to business aviation, that would make for a product that stands out uh, from the others. Um, but as far as uh, size and range capability, the whole spectrum from small to large is pretty much covered by one or more manufacturers. Um, the, the theory and the direction some are heading is the next step is speed. You know, we're, we're, we're done with cabin, we're done with range. I mean, how, how far can you fly, you know, right. basically pull the pull. Um, you know, we don't need more range. The cabin is plenty big enough. So one, one idea is to, uh, you know, go, go supersonic. Yeah, all right, so what's the realistic, yeah, yeah, Arian's come a long way. They got the engine, partnership with GE. Seems like they're a long way in their design. Is there a market for a hundred and fifty million? You know, what's the market for a hundred and fifty million dollar supersonic jet? Um, Three hundred and ten years. <laughs> we've we've looked into it before, and that seems to be have been a consistent number for a couple decades. Every time someone's done a little study on that market, um, yeah. it's it's definitely there. Uh, That's a big number. Yeah, about uh, yeah, thirty a year for ten years or so. So it's. Uh, that's not, a big. That's a big yeah, number. That chump change. What about point to point? Um, you've got guys out there like XTI aircraft. Some people coming out with eVTOL. XTI, you know, putting together investors and coming up with a concept design. You know, sort of like the uh, you know, a little bit of you know, AW six hundred nine ish, where you know VTOL, PT six powered, three hundred knots for you know five hundred miles, six hundred miles. Does that? Right. And, and you're speaking of the ur urban air mobility market. Yeah, and kind of the urban. Is that the next? You know, is that the next? Is urban air mobility really? Uh, you know, what's that market going to look like? Yeah, that 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 has to shake out. Um, th there's a similar experience um, when investors got excited from Wall Street on the Eclipse. Um, yep. Back, back a number of years ago, and that ended up that. that but those that aren't familiar with it, that was an entry level jet. Um, that was designed from scratch, and it had a very low um, entry point as far as price, which which rapidly went up to, to try to mm -hmm. save the company. Um, but at the end of the day, that was about a billion, billion and a, dollar, billion and a half dollar a hole, smoking hole in the ground by the time it failed, and it hasn't really been able to be successfully resurrected. Um, this time, we see a, another rush into our industry. Um, there's even more investors. Um, there's some big time um, technology companies getting involved, you know, Uber, you know, just Amazon, just, just all of them have an interest. So I've never seen this kind of financial backing behind a new idea like this. Um, the thing that still keeps me on the fence about them is anyone who has a hobbyist drone you know, knows that you can, you know, hear it when you fly it. Well, imagine scaling that up to something that carries, you know, four or six people. And even though it's electric, it's still very noisy, just the, the spinning blades. And I'm, I'm hopeful there's a way to uh, break that uh, and fix it from a technology standpoint. But for me, that, that kind of sound level, uh, there'll be pick, people picking up the phone in cities and complaining. And I, mm -hmm. I can't see it, you know, moving forward until they you know, tackle that problem a little better. Yeah, I've thought about it, too. Look, I like the concept of urban mobility. Uh, you know, I, I think it's great. You know, the EV tall. I love the concept of it. The technology is here. I've always said that the the, the challenge is going to be the challenge to overcome is going to be the regulatory and the community exactly. environment. Yeah, you, know, you got to make you got to get acceptance by the communities and prove to communities that these things aren't going to be falling out of the sky into the schoolyard and killing little Sally. Um, yeah, you know, but I definitely think that there's a technology, you know, that the technology will be there. We just got to find the market. And once yeah. that market, once that market is there, it's probably off to the races. But I, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of legwork that's got to be, be done yeah. with that first. But, but it's exciting to see an interest in our industry, you know, from, yeah. from outside our normal ranks. So, you know, hopefully something will get done somewhere in between the, uh, you know, far-fetched ideas and the realistic. I, I think there'll be something new. But I'm well, you just think about it. you think about the avionics development and the connectivity development and airspace. You know, the opportunities to bring technology, airspace management, and things like that. Um, you know, it, it yeah, it brings a lot of opportunity to our industry. Yeah, and a yeah. lot of and a lot of solutions that nobody's even thinking about uh, to problems nobody's even thinking about right now. So right, you know, one one example is a. Uh, you know, battery technology and, and energy density and these things. And, 
while, while they may be m might be you know tested in the UAM, they they could migrate up and you know come into small training aircraft initially, maybe into larger aircraft as a hybrid electric, where you take off of a traditional engine but then switch over to electric. So I think there's a lot of cool things happening in that market that can translate into more you know tr traditional aircraft that we're familiar with. Yeah, and I look at like from a DOD standpoint too, you know, you talk about almost disposable air vehicles from a you know DOD transport or yeah, look there's there's so many things you can do with that that market. It's pretty right, exciting. Right, cuz with, with with DOD they're not so concerned about regulations, so you can, you know, push it right. through without certification. And you can fly aut autonomously too. And right. send things around without people to pick things up or pe pick people up. So yeah, de definitely the military would be a great opening opportunity for those. So so are you, are you bullish? You know, for the next, what are you thinking? Are you are you bullish, bearish, or cautious for the next five six years? Yeah. So again, we we've been flat for ten years. So I don't have to be a rocket scientist to to, to say uh, you know what deliveries will be this year probably a little over 700 this year but that's again because of the low low value sf50 um, i'm encouraged that there's a a slug of new products that came into the market so that if we do do slow down um, there's hopefully still some excitement and some some buyers out there with a reason to buy um, but i don't see the you know business exactly you know being explosive but i don't see it um, going off a cliff like it did in 06 07 um, there was a lot of speculation in the market back then. Um, order backlogs weren't really solid, so that when um, the, the 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 hammer did hit, uh, th there was a, a huge impact on the industry. With oh, yeah. you know folks like Cessna losing, uh, I think at one time they had 17 billion in backlog. That went down to about a billion. Their their workforce went down to half. I I don't see a similar thing during the next slowdown. It'll be more a traditional slowdown. Yeah, it was crazy. I remember when people were flipping positions and making a million bucks. You know, they they put a they put a deposit down on a GC, you know, G whatever, Gulfstream whatever, and yeah, flip the position right. five months later, and they'd make a million dollars to the next guy. And it was like crazy. And then the OEMs were, you know, were were putting things in contracts that you know, hey, you can't flip the position, and and uh, you know, it just told you how on fire the market was. So yeah, they yeah. right. Ho hopefully, there's some. Uh, yeah, emergency relief valves in the contracts today, like like you can't flip it, or if you do, you lose the warranty. So there's little little tricks an OEM can put in there to try to reduce that. Yeah, but but oh, to get back to those uh, oh, to get back to those days of uh, of industry excess, I, I think everybody would love to see it again. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming on, Brian. I, I pre I'd love to yeah, love the conversation. You got to come back in a couple right, months. Please. Yeah, tell us what uh, tell come back with an industry update and tell us where we go uh, where we go at the end of 2020 into 2021. How's that sound? All right, excellent.